Officer, ready. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. May I have your attention, please? Before we begin this meeting, we ask that everyone silence your cell phones. The Fort Bend ISD Board of Trustee meeting is an open meeting for the public to observe the board conducting district business. Therefore, audience members may address the board during the designated audience item section on the agenda. If you have any printed materials you want to give to the board members, you must provide them to the board secretary, Norma Perez, or to me, and we will provide them to the board. We also ask the members of the audience be respectful of others, remain quiet during the meeting so that everyone is able to hear the proceedings. For your convenience, microphones have been provided on both sides of the boardroom. Please speak directly into the microphone if you're asked to answer a question or address the board during the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, officer. The time is 6.02 p.m. We have the presence of a quorum and this meeting has been duly called and notice of the meeting has been posted for the time and manner required by law. I want to make a quick announcement before we rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I want to announce that we are moving our entire consent agenda, including the middle school zoning, before our closed session this evening. So if you look at our agenda, we are going to be moving the consent agenda and the zoning item before our closed session. Will you please, will you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance and remain standing for the silent invocation. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, with, individual, with liberty and justice for all. I pledge allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state under God, and an indivisible. Please remain standing for our silent invocation. You may be seated. First up are our recognitions, Dr. Dupree. Thank you, Mr. Burdine. If the board would join me in front of the dais, we have quite a few outstanding students and staff to recognize this evening. President Burdeen, Dr. Dupree, members of the board, I'd like to introduce a couple of outstanding students from Oakland Elementary. Can we please have Ms. Amory Baker and Dylan Campbell, fifth graders, come forward, please? Amory was selected for her outstanding leadership skills and her desire to serve others, while Dylan was selected for being a respectable, responsible student who demonstrates leadership by taking initiative. Thank you both for being here. <laughs> Next, we would like to recognize five outstanding students from Dulles High School. Dulles High School. They competed in the Texas A&M Science Bowl Tournament and they have qualified to compete in the National Science Bowl. So if your team can come up, I'm gonna call their names out. Go ahead and join your colleagues up there. We've got Andrew Liu, Cherie Mohan, Ethan Zahid, Naveen Mokot, and Chris Single. And then our sponsors, we have Judy Matney and Dr. Chandra Mohan. Let's go ahead and group, let's get a group photo together, yeah. Make sure we put this on our website. Students, why don't you join us in the middle right there? Excellent. Thank you, Dallas High School. Congratulations, guys. Thank you. 
Next, I'd like to invite Clemens High School Navy JROTC to come forward. We're recognizing them for advancing to the National Academic Bowl Championship. So this team, if you guys want to start making your way forward, this team is one of only eight Navy JROTC Academic Bowl teams in the world to advance to the finals and the only team from Texas. Students, congratulations. <laughs> We're going to do a group picture, and students, I'm going to call your names out while you're getting situated there. We have um, Ankash Krishna, Adam Tao, Amanda Bean, Stephanie Beam, George Ramiro, Odysseus Wang. And let's go, we'll get together for a group picture right there. Yeah, what's the cameras? <laughs> Good job. And we, can we also give a round of applause to our sponsors, Chief Petty Officer, retired Jason Gorsuch, and Captain Michael Camerumbus. <laughs> Thank you for what you do to support our students. Next, we've got Miss Rhonda Mason from Mission West Elementary. There she is. Could you please come forward? I would like to introduce her. She's being selected as the 2019 Tabsy Principal of the Year. We are so excited to have her. She's going to be honored at the 41st Annual Scholarship and Award Celebration at Sam Houston um, Department, the University, uh, the Department of Education, and she was also this year's Outstanding Educational Leadership Doctoral Student of the Year. So big kudos to you and a big round of applause. Thank you for your leadership. Next, I'd like to introduce the Fort Bend ISD Child Nutrition Department. They can come forward. They're being recognized for achieving the prime participant in the Texas Department of Agriculture's Farm Fresh Challenge. Almost 20% of Texas school districts participated in this challenge, and Fort Bend ISD CND was one of the few who met the third highest level of recognition. So as we get together for a picture, I'd like to introduce Ann Strodback, Director, Linda Ankner, Dietitian, Kimberly Launder, Cafeteria Manager from Drawback Elementary, Rachel Lopez is our Cafeteria Manager for Neal Elementary. So good job, you guys. Thank you for what you do for our students every day. We appreciate you. And lastly, I'd like to introduce the Fort Bend ISD communications team. This is the team who um, did an outstanding job this year. We walked away with 26 awards from the Texas School Public Relations Association, our annual banquet. Um, these, award include, these awards include the Crystal Commendation, which is the highest award, a Crystal Certificate of Merit, two Best of categories, seven Gold Awards, nine Silver Awards, and six Bronze Awards for various categories. So congratulations to this team. I'd like to invite them to come forward for a picture as well. We have Amanda Bubella, our Director of External Communications, Natalie Rivera, Assistant Director of Inter Internal Communications, Karen Miles, Rachel Ross, and Tanya Thomas. They're our coordinators. We have Jasmine Rizudin. She is our brand marketing and graphics guru. We have um, our multimedia team represented by Donish Nelson, and our support staff, Deanna, Alvar Deanna Alvarado, Victoria Gonzalez, and Margot DeVault. DeVault. Got a little tongue tied there. So I'm going to join you guys for a picture. So if everybody wants to get together. And I think we also have to recognize the Chief Communications Officer, Veronica Sofer, for her leadership. <laughs>
And that concludes our recognition. Thank you. Next are our audience items. Gonna wait just another minute here for them to come in the room.
All right, let's go for it. Next are gonna be our audience items. I want to remind every speaker that you will have three minutes. Mr. Rosenthal will be keeping time and will give you a 30 second warning. I wanted to also remind our speakers to please keep, uh, to please uh, not speak of board members' names or um, names of employees. So first up is Mr. Gary Monroe. And then after Mr. Monroe will be Pastor Rudy White, Rudolph White. Thank you for being here, sir. I'm an unapologetically black man. I saw a Chronicle article where the superintendent got offended where he was very in support of the 95. I'm confused. If you're a black man, you should have been offended from day one. Is that hard to do? When I'm, a, when I'm black and I'm offended, the world knows. I don't care who has to pay me or who I have to report to. So if you were offended about the 95, you should have been offended from day one. Don't be offended now. Because we don't give the black card back once we take it from you. I sent each one of you an email. I hope you read it thoroughly. I made a bold prediction in HISD, and right here, if you can read, it says five-star general. A bold prediction. I said, Dr. Lathan ain't going nowhere. And that trustee, let's see how you deal with malfeasance in office. Mr. Delegipino is outside, but I'm not him. I don't play like him. I refuse to because I know who I'm playing against. You read the email. You know what I asked. You don't even have, I wish you don't do it. I hope you vote against. I hope you say rezone so you can turn me loose in the morning and find out why I'm a five-star general. Because it's something I know that none of these people know. I got a better team than J. Edgar Hoover. Do what you need to do, but always think about what you're gonna do before you do it. Think about what you're gonna do. And at the end of the day, this is my chessboard. You already gonna make your move. I'm already ready to make mine. And little boy member at HISD, I told you you would be packing your stuff. I told you last Thursday you'd be packing your stuff. Think about what you're going to do before you do it. Because you only get one shot at greatness. 30 seconds. Only one shot at greatness. So when you go in the closed session, put, the, put my picture on the wall and throw a dart at it. But make sure you don't make a mistake tonight. Thank you, sir. Oh, I got, what, two seconds? I already killed it. Okay. I'm cool with that. Yeah. All right. Thank you, sir. I appreciate you. Uh, next, Pastor Rudolph White. Oh, my God, I almost feel like we need to pray. <laughs> In fact, why don't you, while, while, while we're speaking, I'm not used to environments like that, especially with the school board as we have, and we really ought to applaud them for where, where they have come and what they have done. Can you, can you uh, embrace right. that with me? <laughs> for <coughs> making our schools this, what you have done in st state as well as in the nation. I mean, you, we have a great school board as a result of you. And so sometimes you go through challenges such as, I guess, what I've heard, but, but be of good courage. Um, I'm here basically <coughs> for one reason tonight, and that is I, 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 I got to straighten out a rumor, um, unfortunately, and to, to share some things with perhaps some of you board members that may not, were may not privy to uh, our actions as Fort Bend pastors. As a president of the Fort Bend Pastors Association, <coughs> it is the pastor's responsibility to assess to what's going on in the communities, our, our children are in the schools, districts, and so we 
hold the board accountable as well. We called a single member district meeting at my church some time ago, and it's rumored that the board members moved, some of you board members were influential uh, in, in having for, for us to, to have this meeting, and I wanna set the record state straight. I, as the pastor, initiated the meeting at my church with the pastors of Fort Bend to address that we were not for single member district for this board. And we're, we weren't then and we aren't now. This board has done a wonderful job and we've got to support them. If it ain't broke, don't try to fix it. Look at what Houston, uh, what's happening to their schools. In fact, um, your, your first speaker here, he came from that system. But at any rate, I wanna just let the record be known we're not controlled by this board. They're there to serve us. If you have any concerns about how we operate, you, you're welcome to call me. My number is 281-924-9901. You can call me and I will be gladly, very glad to meet with you and discuss how we operate. Now, lastly. You have 30 seconds, Pastor okay. White. Our information, our decision had nothing to do with this board. In fact, we didn't even use your information when we bought our presentation. Donald Berg, who was a former superintendent, president on school board, is a part of my membership. He's a part of my advisory board. He had his church to do research, and I gave everybody specific things to do to research to see what was going on with this situation. That's how we came to our conclusion. And I just want, wanted to go on the record, we're not influenced by this board. Thank we love this board, Pastor. we support this board now, and we will continue to support them as they do what they Thank do. You, Thank you, sir. Thank we you, appreciate sir. you being here. Uh, next, Lopa Shaw. Thank you, ma'am. And after her will be Aparna Desai. Good evening, board and superintendent. I am a parent who have two children in Fort Bend Independent School District, and I do appreciate the work that you are doing for a school district. I know it is a volunteer elected position. You're not being paid, and I do appreciate that. Again, against having said that, um, I'm a little concerned as to uh, the last board meeting and what was brought up and the series of events that have followed since then. Um, I moved to Sugarland, in particular Riverstone, in August of 2017. I am new to this community. I am brand new. I do not have any allegiances. I do not have any, anything with anybody. I am brand new. And I read my emails from Dr. Dupree. I read my emails from our uh, principals. I read my emails from the strategic and planning committees and all of the emails. And I have attended to be an engaged community member. In May of 2018, the facilities master planning update capital plan was to continue, um, was to look at the projected enrollment growth and increase capacity at Fort Settlement to accommodate more students. That was in May of 2018. We come to November 8th of 2018, another email is sent out focusing on elementary schools to relieve overutilization at Commonwealth and Sullivan and amongst other elementary schools in the district. Then 11-16, we're not, we get an email stating we're not where we need to be with land negotiations. We delay the process for boundary. There is not a clear path. This is November of 2018. There is not a clear path. Um, the Fort Settlement attendance boundary process is directly related to the elementary process. This is quoted from the email, so this will be postponed. Come December 2018, there is a call for two focus groups, representatives for elementary 51 and another representative for the high schools. Uh, the survey is sent out again, and I'm sure you know all this. This is the work that you do. This is the work that we appreciate that you do for our children. This is what I follow as a parent, as a taxpayer, as someone who cares about where my kids go to school and the quality of education. I have a child that goes to Ann Sullivan and I have a child that goes to Fort Settlement. Um, 30 seconds. 
But recently, we were, I'm reading the paper, I'm talking with people at m both schools, and there's an article published in the Fort Bend Star on March 12th that shocked me. That calling the community I live in, Riverstone, that harass and bully trustees. Today is the first day I am standing in front of you. I have no intention to harass or bully anyone. I am asking you to make decisions on our ch for our children. Uh, many up. community. <coughs> Thank you very much. Appreciate you. Mrs. Aparna Desai. Respect board members and Dr. Dupre. Um, Anisha Desai, a mere data point in this whole rezoning issue is my daughter, a current sixth grader at Fort Settlement. The rezoning proposal you may be considering impacts her. She has been through this process once before. She was a Commonwealth Elementary when she had to leave during where she was rezoned to Ann Sullivan and had to finish her fourth and fifth grade at Ann Sullivan Elementary. During that transition, she was separated from her friends and had to learn about a new school all over. She was in tears for losing her friends and apprehension about a new school of which she knew nothing. When she went to Fort Settlement Middle School in August of 2018, she made new friends, learned her way around a new middle school, and became a Fort Settlement Choir member. She had planned to be in the advanced choir in Fort Settlement and represent her school. She will now be uprooted again because of this decision. She will be separated from her friends, some who she has been since with since kindergarten, and she has to change her pride in Fort Settlement Falcons to another team. To my daughter, this is devastating. At an age when the kids are already going through so many changes, physically and socially, our kids are forced to deal with much more due to this change. I do agree that overcrowding of schools needed to be addressed, and I understand the new boundaries. But does my daughter have to go through this again this rezoning process all over again? If the board considers and approves the proposal today, then I would like to request the board to please consider giving our seventh graders the option to finish at Fort Settlement Middle School. This is a plea of a mother who has already pacified her daughter once and cannot watch her go through it again. As parents and grandparents yourself, I am sure you all understand the impact of this decision on our current sixth graders who have to leave their friends and their teams behind. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Next, Camille White. <coughs> Thank you for being here. Hi there. Um, we are new to Fort Bend Independent School District. Um, my eight children and my husband and I moved here in, um, in June. The only thing we knew about where we were going was the school district who moved here from Virginia. We knew where our children were going to school. We knew the amenities of the home that we were purchasing. That's it, that's the only thing we knew. We didn't know much about, and that we would have no state income tax, okay. Um, kind of a benefit, but um, I have, I will have two children in high school next year, two children in middle school, two children in elementary school, and two children who have not yet reached school age. I will be a member of Fort Bend Independent School District and my children for the next 17 years, okay? And I'm a very involved mom, my husband's a very involved dad, and we expect the best for our children. We expect the best from them, and we expect the best for them, okay? I'm not saying that either one of these middle schools is a good or better middle school than the other. What I'm saying is, is that if you're going to rezone the children, please only rezone them once. Once elementary school 53 is built, rezone them then. Because we don't need my current fifth grader, who is sitting in the back with a tablet in front of her face because she's a bit shy, to go from a school in Virginia to a school in Texas to a new school in Texas, and then two years later be going to a new school in Texas. 
she doesn't need to go into four schools in five years. Please keep them in mind when you're making your decision. I'm going to give you a little bit of data. Um, the current enrollment at, at First Colony is eight, 958. This is the information that you provided with us with a design capacity of 1515. Okay. I wonder if they can handle a 40% influx of students in a matter of two months. Like I said, I expect the best for my, my children, and I know you try to provide the best to them. Okay. Can they handle a 40% increase in two months, going from, from May until August? Can the administration handle that? Can the faculty handle that? Can the current students at First Colony handle that influx of students? Okay. There is another school. There's another school that was well over capacity <coughs> that, we, that we discussed. There was no rezoning there. What's good for the goose is not good for the gander. I don't know about that. There's a lot of discrepancies um, that have been sent out. Uh, one, for example, is the data that was sent out on that seven slide presentation. Here's a discrepancy. There is actual data in there that is, dis that, that is incorrect. We need you guys to be held accountable. Time's up. Our children hold you accountable. Thank you, ma'am. We appreciate you being sure. here. Next is Ava Imperial. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. <coughs> My name is Ava Imperial. I am the mother of four children in Fort Bend ISD. I am a former teacher with 12 years experience in the Texas public school systems. I am a resident of Avalon and Riverstone, and I am in favor of balancing the populations between Fort Settlement and First Colony Middle Schools. I am not here to argue numbers of present capacity or the discrepancies of one-sided reporting or hastily written petitions. I am here to point out simple logistics that come hand in hand with a crowded school. Before moving to Riverstone, I lived in Telfair, where three of my children attended Cornerstone Elementary. I taught in full capacity elementary schools in Aleaf and Cypher. Based on my experience in the classroom and as a parent in a crowded school population, I want to point out a few things. Number one, traffic. The increase in vehicle and foot traffic combined with often insufficient numbers of crossing guards endanger our children's safety. Two, performances. Having 10 classes in my twins, first grade, my twins grade level, performances had to be divided into two nights so as to allow for enough seating for the audience. Third, lunch times. A student's lunch time may very well fall within the first two hours of the day or the last two hours of the day. That leaves five consecutive <coughs> hours without eating. For a good number of students, this is not conducive to learning. Snack times help, but still fall short. Not to mention discipline. We all know a hungry child is not the most cooperative. Four, classroom management. Our already overworked teachers will have to dedicate more time to discipline in a crowded school. This is in addition to teaching the required curriculum, differentiating <coughs> lessons, extracurricular activities that they may sponsor, and just connecting with their students, our children. Who wouldn't want a school with a more balanced population that provides teachers with more opportunity to do just that? We are talking about middle school. This is the toughest age to be and to teach. Their bodies and brains are going through huge changes. They are easily influenced. They could get lost in the shuffle because they don't want to draw unwanted attention to themselves. Why would any parent not want that age child to be in a more manageable sized school? We all knew that one great teacher, counselor, or principal with a keen eye. The one that just knew something was amiss and helped guide us in the right direction. They are still out there for our kids. Why not increase that chance of our child finding that one by keeping the populations manageable? Why not make those changes to put that in place now while we have the opportunity? Why not take this teachable moment and prepare our kids that although this school may not have been their first choice, that there are other good schools out there? Let's teach that life lesson that we make new friends throughout all stages of life. I have said these things before in smaller groups, but recent press has compelled me to speak my piece in a more public seconds. forum. There is a small, loud group from my neighborhood that has gained a fair amount of press. I have read the online articles, petitions, and social media posts. I have viewed the news coverage. Every time I do, I think they do not speak for me, and it's about time I said that out loud. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Please hold your applause. Thank you. Next is Alyssa Jarvis. I wanted to make the, the comment once again as I started the meeting. We are moving up. The, we are going to vote on zoning and our entire consent agenda before we go into closed session, which is going to be after our infor information item next. So for those that wanted to stay, um, we'll be moving that up. Thank you. You'll have three minutes. Thank you. 
I am a member of the 2019 Board Leadership Academy. Last Tuesday, we were given a peek inside the incredible amount of policy guidelines from the federal and state governments that are then put into action by Fort Bend ISD. It is shocking how complicated education is. I don't know why anyone would want to want the thankless responsibility of governing an ISD. It is either because a school board is a stepping stone to, a further, to further political aspirations, or it is because they deeply, passionately care about the children. Having interacted with these board members, I can say it is because they care about the children and the citizens of this district. These board members serve at the pleasure of the voters. They receive no pay for the countless hours of work they perform. They endure slanderous attacks on their character and reputation. I stand here tonight to thank you for your service to our community. As for those who oppose redistricting, Fort Bend ISD is one district. In order to succeed, it must function as one district. Last Thursday, as part of the Leadership Academy, we toured four different schools in the district. Each one was very different. All of them had the same, but all of them had the same commitment to the students. Education is not a building. Education is not the resources of a particular school. Education is not even the programs of the school. Education is what happens when children with inquiring minds connect with teachers who have a passion to inspire learning. Each school has its own exclusive blend of building, resources, students, educators, and parents that come together to create a unique fusion of education. As one district, stop fighting for a building or a territory. Model for your students how to constructively cooperate with those with whom you disagree. Board members, I support your effort to balance the attendance of these schools as you have diligently determined. Parents, if you fundamentally disagree with this board or any of this board's decisions in the state of Texas, you are 100% within your rights to home educate your children. 30 seconds. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Next is Mrs. Karen Sun. Thank you for being here. You'll have three minutes. As a Riverstone resident zoned to First Colony Middle School, I'm here to let you know that my neighbors and I strongly support for balancing enrollment between First Colony Middle School and Fourth Settlement Middle School. Last June, the board approved to rebalance enrollment between these two schools. We are glad that this is now taken up by the board as promised. We believe it's in the best interest of all students and taxpayers to have good middle schools with balanced enrollment. Specific to Riverstone area, due to the sheer size of our community, it is impossible to fit all our students in one middle school. Having two equally good middle schools in the area is the best for the entire community. However, when one school is substantially underutilized and the other school is crowded, neither school can function at its best and provide quality education that our kids deserve. I was in the focus group meeting regarding balancing these two schools last Wednesday. The proposal made by FBIC admin is a true long-term solution. Based on that proposal, for the next 10 years, the utilization level of both schools will stay within 80 to 90 percent. It ensures that no middle school level rezone will be needed for very long time. From what I saw, majority of the focus group members really support this proposal. Keep talking about rezone will only make people anxious due to the uncertainty. The way to heal our communities is to come up with a long-term solution and put it into effect without dragging so people can leave rezone behind them, adapt to the new life, and don't worry about another rezone for many years. Today, we have a good solution for middle school. Tomorrow, ES53 will bring the same peace of mind at um, elementary school level. One by one, 
Long-term solutions are implemented. Problems are solved. It's time to act. We trust you as the district leaders to make the right decision for all of us. However, we also understand that sometimes making the right decision is not easy. It takes wisdom and courage. In the last few weeks, we have witnessed several personal threats and attacks against the board members on the internet. We want to let you know that we are here to support you. You have put in tremendous effort in serving our district. You are our true leaders. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Please hold your applause. Last, we have Melanie and Barchi. Thank you for being here. Good evening, Board of Trustees and uh, Dr. Dupree. I just wanted to say that um, since Commonwealth first started becoming overcrowded back in 2012 and 2013, I've been watching these Board of Trustee meetings and following this issue. From the outside looking in and not fully understanding the process, I have to admit I initially thought the Board of Trustees may be doing something wrong. However, after attending the Leadership Academy this year, getting to know people involved and how the process works, I've come to realize it is much more complex and harder than it looks from the outside. I just want to thank the Board of Trustees for their service and the commitment to public education. I want to recognize the tremendous amount of time it must take to constantly stay on top of all the various issues in a district this large. Things can easily get rather confusing, especially for the public who are not involved in the day-to-day -day operations of the district. Take, for example, this recent issue of rebalancing, which was originally recommended by a steering committee of community members in 2014, as well as by a paid consultant, and then again in 2018. Each time it was recommended to balance enrollment in order to provide equitable learning opportunities as prescribed by policy. Originally, the Board of Trustees stated that when Thornton opened, they intended for Creekstone and Brookside to move to First Colony Middle School. But somehow, Dr. Dupree stated that they overlooked that when they came to the time of rebalancing Thornton. So then we move ahead to January 2018 when the consultant and the steering committee rec recommend rebalancing again. However, for some reason, late one night in May, one member of the Board of Trustees implied that the community wanted additions at Fort Settlement Middle School instead. That was how the additions at Fort Settlement Middle School came about, even though it was contrary to years of community and consultant input and recommendations. Thankfully, when the Board of Trustees was reminded of the actual history and facts of the policy, at the June 18th meeting, the members of the Board of Trustees reversed a decision to add on to Fort Settlement Middle School. At that same time, they voted, all but one voted, to follow the community input gathered through the formal process and honor the input of the steering committee and established to gather it by following their recommendation to balance enrollment between these schools. The vote was approved to rebalance at the appropriate time. When asked when this would be, administration stated that this occurs every, that indicated that this occurs every year in February after the new PASA data is received during the annual enrollment review. 30 seconds. Our communities have waited patiently for the words annual enrollment review to show up on the agenda in February. I cannot speak for all communities, but I personally am thankful that the board is honoring and respecting the input of the steering committees chosen to represent the communities who have worked so hard. Especially, I am grateful that they are uh, continuing to uphold the policies in light of the, in face of the intimidating threats and false accusations. Thank you for keeping the facts and policy forefront in your decision making. Thank you very much. We appreciate you being here. <coughs> we have our information item next, <coughs> our 2019 college career and military readiness, Dr. Dupree. Yes, sir, I'm gonna turn it over to Deanna Saavedra, our chief academic officer to introduce the presentation. Thank you. Good evening, President Burdeen, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Dupree. Thank you for this opportunity to present the College, Career, and Military Readiness, or CCMR, updates. The district's mission, vision, and priority of graduating students with the attributes in the profile of a graduate hold us accountable to the future readiness of our Fort Ben ISD students. Deanna, one sec. All right. Got it? Go ahead. Sorry about that. Do I need to move? Okay. Is it the mic? I think that one's on. 
Thank you, Dr. Saavedra. Sorry about that. These, the CCMR data in this update provides us with a holistic view in terms oh. of the degree to Dr. which. Dr. Saavedra, I'm yes, so sorry. It's still? Yeah, it's hard for me to hear. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Maybe if we just shut that door over there, that might help. Okay. Dr. Saavedra, I'm sorry, but could you could you start over, please? Sure, absolutely. All right. So this again. Um, the district's mission, vision, and priority of graduating students with the attributes and the profile of a graduate hold us accountable to the future readiness of Fort Ben ISD students. The CCMR data in this update provides us with a holistic view in terms of the degree to which, as a district, we are preparing students for their futures. Our presentation this evening will be organized by each of the following CCMR indicators. College readiness, followed by career readiness, and finally, military readiness. These CCMR indicators also align with the Vision 2020 performance targets which track equitable access to advanced course opportunities, college readiness exams, and the earning of post-secondary degrees and certificates. The significance of this data with respect to the future readiness of our students in Fort Bend ISD assists us with determining the degree to which students are prepared for post-secondary success, including college admissions, career and workforce pre uh, preparedness, along with military enlistment. Our presentation this evening, um, our presenters, I'm sorry, this evening are Steve Shields, Director of Counseling and Post-Secondary Readiness, along with Meredith Wadisek, Director of Career and Technical Education. At this time, I'm gonna hand the presentation over to Steve so she, he can sh share the specifics of the data that I noted earlier. Thank you, Deanna, and thank you President Burdine, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Dupree. I'd also like to, I'd also like to thank my team. Who, who, who's here? Two of my team members, Tiffany Luce and Kelly Fox. If you could stand up. Thank you. So the college career military readiness indicators, which are found in the Taper Report, the Texas Academic Performance Report, or the Taper. Um, shows that the district, the district CCMR score is 61.4%, which means that 61.4% 61 of our students have hit at least one of the college, ready, college career military readiness indicators. So some of the students hit more than one. And I'll be covering, as Deanna mentioned, I'll be covering the college readiness indicators, which include TSI criteria, which is met through the ACT, SAT, and TSI, AP exams, and dual credit. And then Meredith will be, co will be covering career readiness, which includes the CTE co coherent sequence of courses, industry certifications, and finally the military readiness, which is a, a new indicator to be covered this year. So this isn't an actual indicator, but it is a precursor to the SAT. And we also, um, as a team, consider it an, it an intervention for our students. We have all of our students from eighth grade to 11th grade take the PSAT at least four times before taking the SAT. This provides them with a personalized study plan through Khan Academy, as well as important AP potential data that campuses use to target students that are underrepresented who are not taking AP exams or, or the courses. Um, we, um, so just to quickly summarize this particular slide, we, all, of, all four of the grade levels have shown improvement in reading and math, um, and they have outperformed the, the district, or they've outperformed the state and the nation, um, and with the exception of the 11th graders. And so I'll, I'll touch upon that with the SAT. Um, and finally, I do wanna mention that 80, we had 87 seniors this past year who were recognized, um, who, who were um, National Merit finalists. 
So all this is preparing students for the SAT. And for the class of 2018, this has provided us with a second year of data. And College Board is explicit about not comparing the new re redesigned SAT to the old data, so, so we do not have trend data yet. Um, we can say that for as far as SAT participation, the number of exams taken, we have had a 6.9% increase as compared to the class of 2017. The district mean right now um, for, the, for the class of 2018 is 1123, and this um, outperforms Texas and the, and the district. So we saw as juniors that they did not outperform the nation um, in the PSAT, but once we get to, yeah, once we get to um, the actual SAT, they outperform the state and the nation. So for the ACT, we do have five-year trend data. ACT hasn't made any changes in their, in their test, so we have five years of trend data. And you can see that all of our student groups have shown growth over the last, four, the last five years. And this is while the state, as you can see with the black line that's towards the bottom, the state has trended from 20.4 down to 20.3, where our, our, all of our student groups have increased. I also thought it was significant that the class of 2018 hit five-year highs in English, reading, science, and their composite score. So if we look at, um, and one of the things that I do want to quickly mention that when we're looking at the ACT and also um, with the SAT, there, there is some discrepancy between our student groups. I didn't, I didn't want to miss pointing that out. Um, and one of, the, one of the critical interventions that we do as a, um, as a district and as in my team is to help bridge the gap is to um, increase access to advanced course opportunities such as AP and dual credit. And those are the final two I'm going to address. So 24.9% 24, um, of our students um, has hit the, the um, CCMR indicator through the AP exams, scoring a three, four, or five. And as we can see over the five years, we've had a 28% increase in the number of AP exams administered. And we've had a 18% increase in the number of scores of three, four, or five. So the one, one significant thing with the class of 2018 is it's had the highest passing rate as far as the number of, of exams attempted and the number of exams receiving three, four, or five. We, we saw 67% of our student of AP exams scored at three, four, or five which is the highest in the past four years. The last advanced course opportunity is dual credit. Oh, actually first we're gonna take a look at the AP exams by student group. So we can see that the, for the, our Asian students, there's a pretty significant gap between them and the rest. And this is the number of students, not the number of exams who have, who have taken AP exams, the number of students. And while there's a, a significant gap, one of the things that I wanna point out on the positive side is that our African-American students and Latino students have showed a higher rate of growth. Our Asian students over the last five years have increased by 28%, while our African-American students have increased by 36%, and our Latino students who have led the charge um, are up, as far as growth, are up 45% over the past five years. So now looking at the, the final, um, our final advanced course opportunity, which is also an indicator so we had 14.5% of students in, from the class of 2017 who earned the CCMR indicator using dual credit. And we can see over the past six years, um, we've had a, a large increase in dual credit courses, a, a large increase in the enrollment. So it, over the, since 2013-14 to last year, which our students completed, um, we had an increase of 355% in dual course and, and dual credit enrollment. And looking at our, our student group, we see more of a, a district representation and more of a diversity. Um, all of our student groups have increased by triple digit growth over the last five over the last five years, with the exception of our white students. And so now I'm going to turn it over to Meredith and she is going to talk about industry certifications. Good evening, Dr. Dupree, President Burdine, board members. Thank you for having us this evening. Thank you, Steve. I'd like to address our industry certifications. The slide that you are looking at shows a marked increase on our attempts and attainment, especially in 2017 and 18. 
There was significant work put into training our teachers and increasing their preparedness to give our students the opportunity to take and be prepared to pass those exams during the 2017 summer in preparation for this school year. It's important to note that the CTE leadership team is also putting in place a monitoring and review process. We know that we are not seeing 100% of our students actually attempt and attain certifications in aligned courses as of yet, but we have made significant increases and are working with campus administrators to make sure that that is occurring. The next slide that we are looking at is students who have earned certifications by student group. And before I address the information in here, I think it's important to point out that a student can count in multiple <coughs> student groups. So for example, Meredith Wasik's student could be counted in each of these one, each of these student groups on the slide. You will notice that we made significant gains in all areas across the district, and it is critical to show that the distribution of our gains is similar to the distribution of the demographics of our school district. Similar to the previous slide, we made significant gains in 2017. This just happens to look at it through a different student group. Um, it's important to understand that we are strategically removing barriers through that teacher preparedness and alignment. We do anticipate these numbers will continue to trend upward. However, it's important to know that the CTE leadership team, in conjunction with teachers and business and industry partners, review what certifications we are providing to our students each year. In some cases, it may be that if a certification is omitted by industry or is no longer valid, we would remove that and then we would see some fluctuation in numbers over time. As Steve pointed out at the beginning, coherent sequence is also a number that the state looks at in our CCMR report. Over the past few years, we have really worked to identify what the coherent sequence of courses are for each student and for each program area. You can see that we've made significant gains in this school year from previous school years. That has a lot to do with the collaboration among many different departments, including counselors, college and post-secondary readiness, CTE, teachers, and administrators across the district. Um, because of the increased number in the 2018-19 school year, we do anticipate that we will see even more increases in our 2018 industry certification data. What is very interesting about this is when you look at it from the state perspective, the state only allows us to count the certifications of students who are calculated as a coherent sequence taker in our CCMR data, which is why we only reached 1.5% earlier um, in the year. So from that perspective, just to make sure that we all know what a coherent sequence taker is, it is any student who intends to or does successfully complete three or more credits in the same program pathway and two or more classes. And the reason the state calls it out that way is because we have some courses that are worth more than one credit themselves. And moving into our military readiness, as Steve pointed out, this is an added feature of the college and career and military readiness indicators. Um, for many students, the U.S. Armed Forces is a very valid opportunity for them to move into. It gives them many, many opportunities for scholarship, job training, and college and lifelong career goals. For the class of 2017, we had 1.4% who met the CCMR requirement via military enlistment. That is a total of 80 students across the district. Our final data slide really combines three different aspects of college, career, and military readiness. It is the